Aloha. Today's talk is about dementia-capable care of adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and dementia. My name is Dr. Rita Bell Fernandez. I am an associate professor at the Department of Geriatric Medicine, John A. Burns School of Medicine at the University of Hawaii. I am thrilled to bring this training as an affiliated regional trainer for the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices, also known as the NTG. Today's presentation is sponsored by the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Department of Health and Human Services, Washington, D.C. This federal grant was awarded to Catholic Charities Hawaii for the Alzheimer's Disease Program Initiative. The NTG is comprised of a coalition of interested persons and organizations. Their mission is to ensure the needs and interests of adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are affected by Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, as well as their families and friends. This goal is a part of NAPA, which stands for the National Alzheimer's Project Act. To learn more about these resources, please visit the website listed on the screen. What is the risk of dementia in persons with intellectual disabilities? Most adults with intellectual disabilities are typically no more at risk than the general population. The only exception is adults with Down syndrome. They are at a greater risk. It occurs at a younger age in their 40s and 50s and tends to have a more rapid progression. Here is another slide looking at the prevalence. You can see that in Down syndrome, for persons who are between 40 to 50 years of age, the prevalence is around 22%. But if you are over the age of 60, it is more than half. 56% have the prevalence of dementia. What about dementia in the general population? Across the U.S., we see that more than 5 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease. One in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or another dementia. It kills more than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. By 2050, the number of people aged 65 and older with Alzheimer's disease is projected to reach 13.8 million. What about Hawaii? In our state for the year 2020, it is estimated that approximately 29,000 people have Alzheimer's disease. By the year 2025, this number is going to rise to 35,000. However, a lot of people working in nursing homes, foster homes, care homes tell me, Doctor, I'm sure the number is much higher than that. And they are probably right. What we are seeing is only the tip of the iceberg. In Hawaii, the figures do not include those who are underdiagnosed or undiagnosed. Just as with an iceberg, the greater portion of the ice is below the water surface. In the same way with dementia, a great majority of persons with dementia are going undiagnosed or underdiagnosed. What is Down syndrome? Down syndrome was first described by an English physician, John Langdon Down. It is a developmental disability that has both intellectual impairment and physical abnormalities. It occurs in one in 750 live births. Down syndrome is also known by another name, trisomy 21. And this is because they have an extra full or partial copy of chromosome 21. You can easily recognize the physical traits and characteristics associated with Down syndrome, such as low muscle tone, short stature, an upward slant of the eyes, or a single crease across the center of the palm. 
Let's see what this is like with karyotyping, a laboratory procedure that looks at a person's chromosomes. In this slide, the chromosomes are all in order except for chromosome 21. Persons with Down syndrome have three copies of chromosome 21. What else is going on in Down syndrome? Besides dementia, they are also at risk for premature aging. Diseases that you normally associate with grandma and grandpa, such as heart disease, osteoporosis, high cholesterol, all now occur earlier in Down syndrome. Many individuals with Down syndrome age prematurely in their 50s. They are at increased risk for these diseases and changes about 20 years earlier than the general population. Many people ask me, Doctor, what is the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Are they one and the same? I'd like you to think of the flower world. In the beautiful flower kingdom, we have orchids, hibiscus, heliconias, bird of paradise, and plumerias as well. Living in Hawaii, I look to the house on the left, they have plumerias. I look to the house on the right, they have plumerias too. And maybe everywhere I look, I see a lot of plumerias, as these are the most common flowers on the island. Similarly, in dementia, there are many types of dementia. A person may have dementia from Parkinson's disease, stroke, or Lewy body disease. There are many causes of dementia, but the most common cause is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is gradual in onset and characterized by short-term memory loss. There is generalized shrinking of the brain, brain atrophy, and it is highlighted by amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. You see this typically after death on brain autopsy. Why are we focusing on Alzheimer's disease? The reason is because Alzheimer's disease presents differently in persons with Down syndrome. It is different from what we are used to in the general elderly population. In Down syndrome, you might get abrupt onset of seizure activity when there has been none in the past. Maybe the person becomes incontinent when the person has been always independent in toileting. The short-term memory loss depends on the previous level of memory demands. Also, one might notice sleep-wake cycle disturbances. Every person is unique and the presentation is unpredictable. Remember that Alzheimer's disease can present differently in Down syndrome. Dementia affects all aspects of functional ability, not just memory. It affects language skills, ability to focus and pay attention. It affects reasoning and judgment, sensory perception, and the ability to sequence tasks. Why are we focusing on Alzheimer's disease? The reason is because Alzheimer's disease presents differently in persons with Down syndrome. It is different from what we are used to in the general elderly population. In Down syndrome, you might get abrupt onset of seizure activity when there has been none in the past. Maybe the person becomes incontinent when the individual has always been independent in toileting. The short-term memory loss depends on previous level of memory demands. Also, one might notice sleep-wake cycle disturbances. Every person is unique and the presentation is unpredictable. Remember that Alzheimer's disease can present differently in Down syndrome. Dementia affects all aspects of functional ability, not just memory. It affects language skills, ability to focus and pay attention. It affects reasoning and judgment, sensory perception, and ability to sequence tasks. 
What we are faced with in this population is a challenge where traditional screening tools are not useful. The traditional screening instruments that we use in general population for grandma and grandpa, they are designed for people with average baseline intelligence and they are not useful for detecting cognitive impairment in adults with Down syndrome. Let's discuss the tools that are available for early detection screening for dementia in this particular group. Now we are going to move on to the screening tools. I am very excited to share with you the NTG Early Detection Screen for Dementia, also known as the EDSD. This has been adapted from two previous questionnaires. The NTG recommends that this tool is administered at baseline to persons with Down syndrome beginning at age 40, then annually, and for persons with non-Down syndrome beginning at age 50. This tool has been translated into multiple languages and is available online. Please check out the NTG website on this slide. The Early Detection Screen for Dementia has six pages. Pages 1 and 2 have basic information. Pages 3 and 4 have information about function and indicators of problem areas associated with dementia. Page 5 has coincident conditions and comorbidities. Page 6 has medications and comments. There are four key sections, demographics, rating of health, mental health and life stresses, review of multiple domains including the activities of daily living, language and communication, sleep-wake pattern, ambulation, memory, behavior and effect, and chronic health conditions. I would like to draw your attention especially to page 2, box 14, which mentions life stresses in the past year. It is very important to give this box due consideration because sometimes the death of a loved one, moving to another household, a new roommate, accident or abuse might show up as depression or dementia. We need to know if there was some significant life stressor in the last 12 months. So please note box 14 on page 2. Who can complete the NTG EDSD? The good news is anyone, a caregiver, family or staff, who is familiar with the person can complete the NTG EDSD if they have known the person for a minimum of six months and have access to the person's records. No special degree is needed. Where do we find the sources of information? Please speak with family members, staff at daycare or day health who know the person. Please look through available records, case management notes, program and personal files. Ask the person who is being screened. Ask friends or other members who are close to them. Please consider taking a short digital video of the person performing certain tasks as this too can be helpful. Often these digital clips can be uploaded into the electronic health record. I have completed the EDSD form now what? First, I would like to thank you for completing the form and greatly appreciate your taking the time to fill out these six pages. Please review the form with other team members. Talk it over with the key staff to ensure there is agreement with the findings. Discuss the findings with the team and supervisor and if there are any concerns about dementia, then please make an appointment to have the person further assessed. If you are a family caregiver, talk about it with other family members or the care team. 
the EDSD form needs to get to the primary care doctor's office so they too can look at what is going on with the person and make appropriate referrals and conduct appropriate diagnostic tests for dementia. Let's take a look at what happens next when you get to the doctor. The essentials of a diagnostic workup revolve around ruling out treatable conditions. Ruling out delirium, depression, anxiety, vitamin deficiencies. A detailed medication review will be conducted because sometimes new medications, changes in doses, drug-drug interaction might account for change in behavior. The provider will also perform a complete history and physical exam, which includes psychiatric history, personal history, past history, family history, and a mental status exam. The provider may order blood tests for dementia, and these are all routine standard testing, such as B12 level and thyroid function. There are radiological tests such as brain CAT scan or MRI that the provider might order. We do understand that it is extremely difficult and challenging to get these tests done in persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I would like you to consider the three D's in dementia. There's D for dementia, D for delirium, and D for depression. How do you distinguish between these three Ds? Remember, dementia is gradual over months to years. Delirium, on the other hand, is just the opposite. It is sudden onset, it's hours to days. Often delirium may be caused by an infection or dehydration. Lastly, you have the third D called depression. And depression might present as unexplained change in mood that lasts for over two weeks. It could be triggered by life stresses, recent deaths, trauma, abuse, which might account for depression rather than dementia. It is very important to look at the three Ds. This is a CAT scan of a brain of two individuals. One has Alzheimer's disease and the other one does not. If you look at the brain on the right-hand side, it has more black areas. That is, there is more cerebrospinal fluid. The white matter of the brain is shrunken. This is also known as cortical atrophy. And the red, blue, and green areas that are circled, that is the hippocampus, the memory area of the brain. If you compare the two sides, the green, red, and blue areas are also shrunken in the brain with Alzheimer's disease. What about medications? There are a lot of medications that have hit the market for Alzheimer's disease. There's Aricep, Namenda, Exelon, Namzeric. These medications belong to the family of choline esterase inhibitors and are used to treat symptoms related to memory, thinking, and language. In studies, they have shown to delay nursing home progression. These medications don't greatly improve memory. We've got to remember that the effect is very modest. They have also done a Cochrane review looking at medications for cognitive decline in people with Down syndrome. When they looked at all these randomized clinical control trials, what they found is generally those who received the medicine did no better than those who received the placebo in any of the areas assessed in the study. Overall, the quality of the evidence for effectiveness is low. Now your role. You may be in a position to be a health advocate. Thank you. You may have the responsibility to look after the welfare of the adults that are in your program. You may be a case manager, a family member, a caregiver, a relative, a friend. 
and you may be in a very special position to get the person what they need. You are engaged in some capacity that gives you access to health practitioners. Let's look at the four steps of health advocacy. Step one is observe. Observation leads to awareness of what is going on. Step two is report. Bring your observation to someone's attention. Step three, prepare for the health appointment. And step four, follow up after the appointment. Why is dementia healthcare advocacy needed? Essentially, you are giving voice to the voiceless. You are helping them speak up. You are helping speak for an adult with dementia when his or her cognitive impairment becomes a barrier to self-advocacy. Occasionally, we find different prejudices such as ageism, racism, sexism. There may be an assumption of automatic loss and decline as a part of normal aging. Other times, there are assumptions that all changes are due to dementia. But that's not necessarily true. Hence, playing the role of a healthcare advocate is critical. And I would like to thank you for taking the time and effort to do this. Let's move on to discussing how a shift in thinking is needed when caring for persons with dementia. We have rehabilitation on one end and we have habilitation on the other end. What is this word habilitation? Habilitation is a term used by dementia professionals to describe the non-medical interventions considered best practices in day-to-day -day care, in creating good environments for persons with dementia with all their relationships and activities. And that is a shift in thinking because in the common medical model, we are all about rehabilitation. You break your hip, you go to rehab. You had a stroke, you go to rehab drug and alcohol problems, you go to rehab. But we now need to think of this beautiful new word called habilitation. There are some key concepts surrounding dementia care and they involve maintaining support, life story, redirection, validation, and orientation. Let's start with the first one maintenance of support. This is generally accepted as best practice in dementia care. It is a very proactive approach and can eliminate hours of behavioral reactions. What you are focusing on is the remaining abilities. You're focusing on respecting the changing needs of the person, providing meaningful failure-free activities allowing them to do as much as they can for themselves. Reducing or eliminating difficult behavior can be done at all stages by reducing frustration, boredom, anxiety, and fear. And this can be done in all settings by staff or in the home environment. Remember that the glass is half full and not half empty. We need to focus on the remaining abilities and not on the losses. Let's look at the next key concept in dementia care, life stories. Everyone has a life story that needs to be honored and respected. The story is the essence of each person and should be documented over the lifespan. Sometimes this is lost. We see persons with intellectual disabilities and dementia who have been moved from one island to another island. They have been moved from one care home to another care home, from one family member's residence to another residence. And in this shifting and shuffling, their life story often gets lost. We need to honor that life story. 
This can be simple things such as displaying their photos or certificates, their medals, what they have achieved in life. We need to honor each person's essence and bring their life stories to the forefront. Another key concept in dementia care is the validation approach. This approach focuses on empathy and understanding. It is based on the general principle of validation, that is acceptance of the reality and personal truth of a person's experience, no matter how confused. If we use this approach, you will see that you can reduce stress, agitation, and the need for medication. Forcing a person with dementia to accept aspects of reality that he or she cannot comprehend is cruel. Emotions have more validity than logic. I would like to give you an example to explain the validation approach. Here we have John who is really agitated. Someone stole my book. One response to John is, John, you're so careless. You're losing your book all the time. Or with the validation approach, you could answer John, I'd be upset too if that happened to me. I'll help you look for it. In the validation approach, we are joining the person in their journey. Let's look at another key concept in dementia care, reorient or not to reorient. The best practice in dementia care today is do not correct or try to reorient the person. This is very hard as it requires a shift in thinking of the staff or family members and shift in their care philosophy. The staff or caregiver may say, Doctor, are you expecting me to lie to the person? Let's look at this example. What time is my mother coming? And you know Ken's mother died 20 years ago. Which response is better? A. Your mother is dead, Ken. Your sister will pick you up at 4 o'clock. Or B. She'll be here in a little while. Let's get a dish of ice cream while we wait. In today's best practice for dementia, response B is the correct answer. Response B is the better, softer, kinder answer. We need to join them in their reality. It's their journey. Another key concept in dementia care is redirection. We need to learn to distract and divert clients or loved ones, especially when they're agitated or having a meltdown. Distracting and diverting can minimize or avoid outbursts and challenging behavior. You could do this by a gentle distraction. You could provide food, drink, rest, a reassuring tone or a smile. It's very easy and can be done. Let's look at an example of redirection. It's 4 a.m. and raining. Harry wakes up and wants to go for a walk. What should you do? Distract and divert. So your response is, sure, let's go for a walk. But before we go, I need to have a snack. And my favorite snack is ice cream. What's yours? By refocusing the attention, you can often redirect behavior. It's best not to argue with the person. It's better not to say, It's 4 a.m. and we're not going for a walk. Are you crazy? You need to go back into bed. That's not a suitable answer. The goal is distract the person long enough that their faulty memory will work to your advantage. Next, we need to look at how behavior is a part of communication. All behavior is communication 
and one needs to be a detective to figure out what is going on. Behaviors are often triggered by so many things such as caregiver interaction, pain, frustration, or a task being too difficult. As far as caregivers go, simple things like, did I argue with the person? Did I display frustration or impatience? Did I do something wrong? Or did I not do something? Often a person with dementia may have pain and they may not be able to express that they are in pain. Please think about pain as a possible contributor to difficult behaviors. What about the task? Am I expecting the person to do more than they can? Will they be able to do this in fewer steps as the disease progresses? Do I need to increase my supervision and support? It could even be the environment. Is this environment too noisy? Is there too much going on or too much visual stimulation? Are there shadows, glares? Is this behavior occurring in the same room at the same time of day? There's a lot to think about and one needs to be like a detective. I would like to do an overview of Dementia Communication 101. A few basic and important things to remember are, please speak slowly and clearly. Use short familiar words and phrases to give adequate time to respond. Ask one question or give one direction at a time. Break down complex tasks into simple tasks. For example, asking someone what would you like to eat for lunch is a complex task, but I could break it down and say, would you like chicken or fish sandwich for lunch? And that's how I make it simple, by giving two choices. Avoid arguing or correcting the person. When approaching a person, Please come from the front and maintain good eye contact. A lot of persons with dementia lose peripheral vision, so please do not speak to them from the next room or even behind them or on the side. You need to be in front of them, come to the same eye level and then speak to them. And remember what we discussed earlier, join validate and distract. It works! Routine and consistency are also important. Establishing consistent routines can be calming and reassuring for both the person with dementia and those around them. Please think about dining at the same time, same place, and the same setting as much as possible. Community outings sometimes might be too challenging and might need to be eliminated or done at a different time of day. Please plan activities ahead so that everything is right there when needed. Create some quiet corners within the home that could be a place of rest. Objects that are comforting and meaningful to the individual can help calm them down. Provide fluids and healthy snacks as challenging behaviors might be a result of hunger and thirst. What can you do? We need to think about adapting activities. Adapt activities such that they are failure free. We need to adapt activities to suit the needs and capacities of the person. We need to focus on simple activities which reinforce self-esteem while relieving boredom and frustration. We need to keep the emphasis on the remaining abilities and not on the losses. Here is another way you can look at these activities. You can modify activities or tasks based on the stage of dementia. In early dementia, they can do a more complex activity or task. However, in the late stage of dementia, 
the task needs to be greatly modified for the increased impairment. For early and middle stage, I would like to encourage you to please involve the person. Help them to participate in the activities and what's going on in the home. Just making sure that we have adapted the activity or task according to the stage of dementia. According to the NTG, the environment plays a huge role in persons with dementia. The environment is so important because a new or unfamiliar setting, a change in routine, all of this can cause confusion and difficult behaviors. Change in staff at day program or residential facility can also give rise to challenging behaviors. Please think about the noise in the environment. Sometimes we are unaware of the loud volume emanating from the TV or radio or the overhead paging system. Some places are really noisy. What about lighting? Persons with dementia need 30% more light than we do. And when you look at lighting, you've got to be careful about glares and shadows. When we think of the environment, we also need to ask, are there too many people in the room? And sometimes that's a challenge because in certain cultures, large families come to visit and that could be overstimulating for the person with dementia. What about cues? Are there any orienting cues to find their way around? Are there signs to say bathroom, bedroom? There is a lot we can do with our environment to make life easier. For persons with dementia, we need to take extra care to make sure they are safe. We need to remove obstacles in the pathways to prevent falls. We need to create an environment supportive for the caregiver as well as the adult with intellectual disability and dementia. Please consider locking or disguising hazardous objects and areas. And if we are concerned about wandering, think about disguising doors for safe wandering. You can disguise a door by painting it the same color as the wall. That's a neat, simple way to disguise a door. In this slide, we see how they have maximized location and function by using different cues like pictures on the doors. You could have a sign, such as a no smoking sign. So instead of arguing with the person, no, you're not supposed to smoke. Smoking is not good for you. Just point to the sign. Look at the sign. Sign says no smoking. Think about light and contrasting colors, especially in the toilet. That's a place where everything is white and having something as simple as a grab bar or toilet seat cover in a different color can help maximize location and function. If you have a client or loved one who wanders, what can you do? The recommendation is to promote exercise and movement. Create safe wandering spaces where the person can sit, drink water or juice, and have a snack. Disguise doors or doorknobs. Use signaling devices to alert when a door is opened in case they might wander to an unsafe area. Allow meaningful activity within wandering as much as possible, such as music, dance, and rhythm. There is a wonderful program from the Alzheimer's Association called 24-7 Wandering Support for a Safe Return. This is available nationally in all 50 states where the Alzheimer's Association has partnered with the Medi Alert Foundation and they can look for the person who are missing right away. You do not need to wait for 24 hours before a person is declared missing. 
if your loved one with dementia is registered with them, they have the photograph to give to all the first responders who can look for the person with dementia immediately as soon as they disappear. The Safe Return program has been very successful in returning clients back home to their families. What about disruptive sleep-wake cycle? Sometimes people call this sundowning. We need to think about ruling out pain, physical discomfort, medications, or other unmet needs as a potential cause. You could try bright light therapy. Limit the person to only short naps during the day. Keep the room dark and quiet at night. You could use red or amber bulbs as night lights. Does dementia affect vision? There are a lot of factors that may be affected by Alzheimer's disease. Visual field is reduced by about three feet from the floor. Depth perception is also reduced. Color contrast and object identification is affected. Visual memory and peripheral vision is affected. We need to remember that persons with dementia have visual difficulties due to changes in the brain. Some suggestions for modification are to reduce visual clutter. Organize visual clutter into specific appropriate spaces. Clearly identify walking paths. Reduce the glare. You can reduce glare by using matted or low gloss surfaces. You could have floors with textures and not shiny surfaces. When you're using cleaning products, no gloss waxes are helpful. These are small helpful changes for a person who has visual difficulties due to dementia. What about hearing challenges? Persons with dementia also have hearing loss. One study reported 83% of people with early to mid-stage dementia having hearing loss. We need to think of the continual noise pollution in our environment, whether it's the air, the fan, the TV, or the radio. Sometimes it may be a simple thing like ear wax. So getting your client to the provider to examine their ears is important because ear wax can be easily removed and can improve hearing for many people living with dementia. How can we reduce noise pollution? Here are some suggestions for hearing impairment. Reduce background noise such as fans, radios, TVs, appliances. Add soft materials such as carpeting whenever possible. Visual or physical cueing along with auditory information is helpful. Whether you're a staff or caregiver at home, speak in short, simple sentences. Give one piece of information at a time, speaking at the eye level after gaining eye contact. Wait longer for the response than you did in the past. And remember, if someone is using hearing aids, they need to get their hearing aid batteries changed frequently. These batteries are very tiny and often people need help with this. Look at this photograph. This is an example of an adult with intellectual disability their residence in a care home or foster home, even your own home. Do you see anything wrong with this living room for a person with dementia? Now, if I gave you a budget and said, there's no restriction, go for it, what would you change here? Some might suggest changing the flooring. It's too dark. Some might suggest changing the couch. That too is dark. Between the flooring and the couch, it is much easier to change the couch. 
you can go today and buy a new couch. It's done and you can quickly improve the contrast in that room. What else is wrong? Do you notice the glare, the shadowing? You can improve that glare by simple solutions such as hanging curtains or putting up blinds on the windows. These are little things that we can do to make our environment better. Look at this photograph. You see one toilet, it's all white. In the other picture, another toilet. A simple thing like a colored toilet seat cover makes all the difference for someone who is having visual problems due to dementia. Here is another toilet. Over here we have Clorox blue tablets in the toilet bowl which has made the water blue. And that adds a depth perception and a contrasting color which will make it easier for someone with dementia not to miss the toilet bowl. Here is a picture of a typical nursing home across the United States where we have a white plate, a white napkin, a white fork and a white mug and then the person is going to sit down and eat white mashed potatoes, cauliflower and some chicken. Try something different like a simple placemat. Having a table mat of a different color can add that color and contrast making the dining experience easier, safer and more pleasurable for someone with dementia. Moving on to our last section of caregiving and caregivers. A great majority of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are not institutionalized. Rather, they are living with their family members in the community. From the 1930s until the 1990s, the mean age of death for persons with intellectual disabilities rose from 18.5 years to 66.2 years. This is due to tremendous success made in the fields of science, technology, sanitation and health. 75% live with parents, spouse or another family member. 13% live alone and important to note only 12% live in a residential facility. Approximately 25% of those caregivers are aged 60 and over with 35% aged between 41 and 59 years. And we see that these numbers are only going to increase with the aging of the baby boomers. What are the unique challenges in caregiving for this group? You see in the general population an average period of time that a caregiver provides assistance to a spouse or older family member with chronic illness is 4.5 years. However, a parent with a child with intellectual disability, caregiving can last for more than 60 years and that's for a vast majority of family caregivers. It is a lifelong career. And with that long duration of caregiving comes a special risk. Aging caregivers for people with intellectual disabilities may be at special risk because of their own age-related health issues. The extensive duration of caregiving takes its toll. And they have concerns about the long-term care of their loved one. Who will care for my child if I die? How will they pay for care? Who will provide the care? It's important that when we make a care plan as part of case management, we address these issues and concerns because they are top on the minds of the caregivers. Another thing we need to do for caregivers is to connect them to resources. A very valuable resource is the Alzheimer's Association. This is a national organization available in all 50 states. They have a 24-7 helpline and that number is 
1-800-272-3900. Our Hawaii Aloha chapter provides services on all major islands and offers caregiver classes and education, support groups and counseling. We also have our statewide Hawaii Aging and Disability Resource Center. You can call them or go to their website for more assistance. I would be remiss if I forget end of life care. People living with Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, different intellectual and developmental disabilities also face the end of life and one must remember that good end-of-life care includes hospice and palliative care. We should not forget about hospice care for this group. How is advanced dementia recognized? It is recognized by evidence of functional decline, poor appetite, weight loss, infections. People are not walking much. They're mostly in bed sleeping most of the day. All this signals advance late-stage dementia and they may qualify for hospice. I have listed some resources for you, the hospice providers as well as our local coalition called Kokua Mau. Please do visit these websites. I will end this presentation by stressing the importance of healthcare advocacy. There are often small interventions that can make a big difference in the quality of life. Staff and family are the experts on individuals with intellectual disabilities. To recognize current changes and symptoms, as well as knowing the person across the lifespan, is the best resource. We need to remember that each and every one of you watching this video today can make a huge difference. Remember, healthcare is an art, not a science. I'd like to thank you for being a healthcare advocate for a client or loved one and for championing this cause. Big mahalo to each and every one of you.